Show. Good morning. Welcome to the Pocono Evangelical Free Church. So glad that you guys can join us today. I uh, do have a few announcements to go through, uh, so I want to get through them. Uh, B, uh, just want to make mention that we have our online service at 6.30 today, uh, so keep that in line for anyone who watches online. Uh, we are planning on doing our men's group on Friday at 6... Uh, at, I said it wrong last week, I apologize. At 9, at 9 in the morning on Friday, so if you are interested in that... Uh, We'd love to have you involved uh, for the men out there. Uh, so please come to that Friday at 9 a.m. Uh, also planning on having Focus uh, th this Thursday at 6.30 here at the church. Uh, keep that in mind as well. Let me just check my text real quick. Okay. I tried to text mom about the women's group, and I, I, my, have no reception, so the text didn't even go out, unfortunately. But uh, I believe you guys are having yes. it next week, if yes. I remember correctly. Okay, great. So women's group meeting next week here at the church at 10 a.m. Uh, okay. Also, want to make mention we have a congregational meeting coming up on the 29th. That's next week. So if you are a member of the church, we strongly encourage you to be there for that. Uh, if you're not a member, but you're just curious as to what's going on and you want to be a part of the meeting, you're welcome to come. You can't vote, but you can certainly listen in. And uh, if you're interested in becoming a member, uh, you can see me today if you'd like to talk about membership and what that all entails. Uh, birthdays. Uh, my, the, this week we have uh, my daughter, Vera. Her birthday is the 28th, so that's Saturday. So uh, just if you see her around, you can wish her a happy birthday. She'll be five years old, so uh, she's, uh, she's excited about that. A few prayer needs uh, to keep in mind. Uh, be praying for Amanda. She's having her knee surgery tomorrow on the 23rd. Uh, so keep her in mind in, in, in that regards. Uh, be in prayer for mom and dad. They're away on vacation, so they're not here today. Uh, but they're getting the chance to, uh, uh, you know, to hopefully rest a little bit. And, and uh, you can be praying for them for that. And also be praying for their travels as well. Uh, praise uh, for Erica. I, I'm sure many of you got the email that she was not feeling well this past week uh, and everything. But uh, we did hear from her and she was able to get out to the, to the store yesterday. So she says she's feeling a little bit better and stuff. So just be, just continue to be praying for her as she recovers uh, uh, from that sickness that she's kind of uh, been going through. Uh, be in prayer for Steve. Uh, Steve is uh, not uh, feeling well. He uh, was feeling pretty sick yesterday. Uh, act very sick yesterday, if, if I can say that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so just be in prayer for him and uh, his, that he would get rest and be able to recover uh, quickly as well. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that more uh, a little bit later. Steve was actually supposed to preach today, so he was uh, getting all ready for that, and uh, I know he very much desires to be here with you all today and share the share from the word uh, but again sometimes we get sick and you know we need a break so just uh, just be prayer in prayer for him and hopefully he, he'll be able to preach in in a, in a, in a couple weeks in the next couple weeks so all right I think that's all I have uh, let's go to the Lord in worship if you'd like to stand you may stand if you'd like to sit you can sit whatever if you can't see the slides you can move so you can see the slides whatever you need to do so that we can worship the Lord together let's do that
to earth and die. Glory to the Spirit, lifts the name on high. The name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus. Make mention there is a basket in the back for tithes and offerings. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you today. We want to give you all honor and glory. We want to glorify you, O oh Father, glorify Jesus who came to earth to die, and glorify the Spirit who is in a, who is alive in us. Yes. Father, we thank you and praise you for the wonderful things that you do. We thank you that you are good. We thank you that you are forgiving, that you are gracious, that you are just. Lord, you are amazing. And Lord, as we sang in praise to the Lord, I pray that we would ponder these things anew. That it wouldn't just become old to us, but that we would be deeply impacted each time as we think upon your character and who you are and what you have done. Father, we pray that you would tune our hearts to sing of your great love. Father, I also want to lift up uh, the different needs that are in our church today. Lord, we lift up Amanda to you as she's getting ready for surgery tomorrow. Lord, we pray that you'd be with the doctors, help them to do the procedure uh, correctly and rightly. And Lord, we pray that, uh, that it would be an effective surgery that would be helpful to Amanda. Lord, we pray that you would give her peace and your comfort as she goes through this. And, and Lord, help her as she heals. Lord, we pray for quick healing of her body. Uh, Father, we also want to lift up mom and dad who are away today and others who might be away. Lord, we pray that you give them safe travels and times of, of rest in you, Father. Lord, also want to lift up those who are sick. I uh, think of uh, Erica. Thank you that she feeling, was feeling better yesterday. And uh, we pray for continued healing for her. And we pray for healing for Steve as he's not feeling well today, Lord. We pray that you would continue to work in them and, and help them to feel better quickly. Lord, we lift all these things to you, O Father. We thank you that you care, and we thank you that you love us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
today and concluding the series that I've been looking at in Luke chapter 12 with verses 11 and 12. Starting in verse 11, that's where we're going to start. We, we've looked at a lot of different things. We've looked at, uh, you know, to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Uh, we see that nothing that is covered up will, uh, will stay covered up. It will be revealed. Uh, nothing hidden will stay hidden. We see in verse 4 that Jesus says to his friends, Don't be afraid of those who can kill the body but can do no more. Fear the Lord. Fear him who has authority. We then see that God cares for us. Sparrows are sold for two cents. Five of them for two cents. Pretty much nothing. Almost free. Not quite, but almost. Sparrows so cheap. 
and yet they're not forgotten by God. And how much more valuable are you? Indeed, God knows even the numbers of hairs of your head. You're more valuable than the sparrows. Jesus goes on to say that everyone who confesses me, I will confess. And whoever denies me will be denied. And then finally, we looked at last week, or uh, last time I preached, in regards to this uh, sin, this unforgivable sin, as some call it to be, uh, that he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And that leads us to our text now today in verse 11 and 12. It says, when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Let's pray. Father, as we conclude this series and we consider the the, the wonders that we see here, that you care for us. Lord, help us to fear you, O oh God. And Lord, even as we look at this area of persecution, as we look at this idea of turning and clinging to you in the midst of difficulty, Lord, we pray that you would help us to be impacted by your word, to apply the word to our lives. May your spirit work within us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today, Steve was intending to preach. Uh, he was uh, uh, getting ready. I was even talking to him on Friday, actually. Yes. And he was telling me he, we actually got the slides up here and everything. And uh, so he was kind of ready to go. And, and then uh, he gave me a text. I forget exactly what time it was, but on Saturday uh, that he uh, wasn't feeling well. In fact, not feeling well at all. Um, and uh, so I was like, oh, okay, well, maybe I, I should uh, start uh, preparing just in case he's not able to make it. I didn't know at the time that he certainly wouldn't be able to make it. So I started prepping. And I'll be honest, you know, I don't usually start my sermon prep on Saturdays, you know. Uh, that's not the norm for me. Uh, usually uh, when I start sermon prep, I start on Tuesday. Tuesday is the day. I have, Monday is my day off. So I start my sermon prep on Tuesday, and I start off by reading the commentaries. That's what I start off by doing, and reading what Strong says, and all these kind of things. I get, I get what, it's more information gathering for me on Tuesdays, right? And then, you know, on Wednesday, I'm probably doing a little bit more of that, uh, you know, and then on Thursday, I start shifting to, okay, now I've got all this information. What? How am I going to develop this sermon? I probably already have my outline at this point in time, and I start piecing things together, and I take, I take my time. I take my time to think through it. I don't rush it, uh, which I think is really important as a pastor that we don't like, oh, I got just want to get this done, right? We want to we want to be immersed in the word of God. And uh, <clears throat> so Thursday, uh, I, have to, I often have other ministry things that I'm doing on Thursdays too. So uh, I got I to do those things. And then Friday, I'm putting the finishing touches. I'm making sure my application is kind of right and so on and so forth. And if I ever find on a Friday that, man, I still am not quite ready, I will use part of Saturday to, to finish finish my sermon. Well, I didn't have any of that this time. And that's okay, because as I was wrestling with the Word of God, the Lord richly blessed that time, uh, even in a, a quick, uh, a more quicker way of, of thinking through this. Uh, I do have sermons that I could have preached that are were older or something, something ready to go, but I didn't want to do that. I really wanted to focus on this text. And I was also not sure still if maybe Steve could be here. And so then I was thinking, well, I was doing work for next week then, you know, and I'll have a leg up. But uh, the Lord is going to use this today. And I hope that the Lord uses this in your life. Uh, this is uh, a sermon that's not as polished, if you will say, as I would like it to be. I didn't have all that time to do that. But the Lord gave me enough time to do what I needed to do to really put uh, thought and wrestle with this sermon. I'm excited to bring this to you today. <clears throat> um, so today we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit teaching us, especially in the midst of persecution. So the title that I have is Holy Spirit Will Teach You. And, uh, and we're going to be looking at this uh, in three different points. Uh, I do not have all my normal slides. I usually I put all the 
quotation stuff. I got the application up there. I was typing it right before Sue. Sue and I started practicing and stuff. And so I got all the application up, but uh, I don't have as many slides as normal. So I do apologize for that. But the first thing we want to look at is do not worry. That's what Jesus says. He says in verse 11, when you, when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and authorities, do not worry. Do not worry. Now, this idea of being brought before the synagogues and the rulers and authorities, many of the commentators made the point that this is both political persecution as well as religious persecution. So uh, in some of your translations, you might see the word magistrates there, uh, as opposed to what my translation says with authorities and rulers and such. But this is the idea of you're going to be persecuted from those outside and those inside, those who are uh, uh, religious and those who are, uh, uh, you know, part of the political world. And it's interesting when we consider uh, what these people that Jesus is talking to, what they faced. Remember, we're talking to the disciples. If you remember, Jesus is speaking specifically to them at this time. And as he's telling them, we think about what did the, what did the disciples go through? Think about the book of Acts. We're going to look at some of those things in, in a little bit. They went through incredible amounts of persecution. And history tells us even greater some of the persecution that they went through. The call and the challenge that Jesus gives as he's talking about this coming persecution is that they don't need to worry. They don't need to worry. You see, worry will not be helpful or beneficial to your defense. Worry is not going to be helpful to, so that you are able to say the right things now. I was worried about it for five days now, therefore I know everything and I'm ready to go. You know, I often talk about worry as the false prophet. I do a lot of counseling in regards to anxiety. I talk about it as a false prophet. How many times did a false prophet need to be wrong in order to become a false prophet? Once. Once. That, how many other times did they say something and maybe get it right, right? <laughs> anxiety is kind of like that. We worry about the things of the future. This could happen. And you know what? It could. It's possible. But it's this overwhelming sense of dread and doom and, and all of that. And the fact of the matter is you don't even know what's going to happen anyway. So even if you're worried about the thing that you might be worried about, and in, indeed could happen, even still you don't know that it will happen. And so I like to think of anxiety as the, as the false prophet. The false prophet. And it tells you, hey, this could happen. It makes you worried. And, and, and Jesus is saying, listen, that's not helpful to you. Because I found, I don't know what your experience is, the more you worry, first of all, the things that you worry about often don't happen. Sometimes they do, and you know you have to deal with it when that comes up. But usually when they do happen, it doesn't happen in the way I worried about them, or the way I planned to deal with it if it came up. Usually something else is thrown into there, and I'm not even aware, and I have to rethink everything. So oftentimes the things that we even worry about, we can't even deal with in the way that we were worrying about them in. Does that make any sense? Are you following me with that? Worry is not helpful. And I believe that's why Jesus says, don't worry. Now, for any of you who struggle with anxiety, a statement like this is something that's hard to deal with, right? G uh, Paul says, be anxious for nothing, right? As we see in Philippians 4, we see Jesus says, uh, don't be worried. Uh, uh, to today has enough trouble of its own. You know, don't worry about tomorrow. Uh, so we see these commands in scripture, but for the person that deals with worry, I'm sure those are statements that's like, yeah, I get that, I know that, but like to actually practice that, that's really hard. And that's fair. I don't think Jesus is saying this as a condemning statement. I think Jesus is saying this to let you know that it's not helpful to you. He has something else for you than worry. It's not that you can always control your fears and your anxieties. You're not always able to control your fears and anxieties. But what you can do is in the midst of your fears and anxieties, you can turn to the Lord. In the midst of your anxieties, you can turn to him in prayer. In the midst of your anxieties, you can rely on him. You can trust in him. I talk to a lot of people that deal with anxiety. And you know what they say to me when I say that? They say, I already do that. I've done that. You know what I say to them? If you're still worried, keep doing it. Right. If you're still worried, you keep praying. If you're still worried, you keep 
seeking the kingdom. If you're still worried, you keep trusting. And after you've done that, what if you're still worried? You do it again, right? So sometimes we think that these are the answers to anxiety. If we do A, B, and C, we will be cured. We will no longer have anxiety. And I don't think that's Jesus' point. I think what Jesus is trying to say is when you are worried, respond this way. That's what I believe Jesus is trying to establish for us in this passage and in other passages, as we'll see in a little bit. Jesus talks a lot about, about anxiety. Many of you probably remember the sermon series that Dad did in Matthew chapter 6. Uh, he did a whole series in regards to anxiety and looked at the context of Matthew chapter 6. If many of you were here uh, when I first got here, one of my first sermon series that I did was from Philippians 4. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, you know, Dad and I have kind of recognized that anxiety is something to talk about. And we need to talk about it. And we have. Uh, but many of you may have not been here. So I do want to give a little bit of that overview of kind of what we've talked about in a lot of that. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6 that worry will not add a single hour to your life. Which, by the way, I think is contrary to what we think of when we think of worry, if I can worry about this enough and plan enough so that this does not happen, then I can extend. <laughs> and the whole point that Jesus is saying is you can't add. Worry does not add anything to you. Clark says it this way in regards to our text. He says, be not anxiously careful because such anxiety argues distrust in God and, infa and, and, and infallibly produces a confused mind. In such a state, no person is fit to proclaim or vindicate the truth. So Clark's point is that the more that you worry, the more your mind is going to be confused and worried and concerned, and, and you're not able to think as clearly as you ought. And so Clark's point is, actually, in the moment of persecution, when you need to stand before those and give a defense, that worry beforehand is not helpful to your cause. It's easy to say in regards to anxiety, but like I said, it's another thing to practice. What a person experiences and feels sometimes is very strong. But you know, God did not just make you to be emotion, right? God did not just make emotions and that's all you are. Uh, back in when in my counseling days, we talked about the four, four circles. Did, you, did they ever teach the four circles, Aunt Debbie, Uncle Randy? Back at Karen? Four circles uh, generally is where, where, where we have our, our thoughts our actions, our emotions, and our motives. And that's kind of like these four circles. So just because you fear something, you can also enforce things in your mind as you think, how do I think correctly and biblically? So even though I feel this, I can still think this way, or I can have a different motive, or I can respond differently. Just because I feel something doesn't mean I have to act on what I feel necessarily. So uh, those are things to consider. You're more than just your anxiety. You're more than just your emotions. I'm not proposing a cure for anxiety. I was telling the guys that we were talking about this as guys. I did not realize I was preaching, let alone preaching on this necessarily, guys. So uh, for some of you who are again like, hey, we got just, we're getting some repeat here. That's okay. I, I did. The Lord actually used this to help me prepare. So it was it was really cool. But uh, but uh, one of the things I was I was uh, telling the guys, my Bible. In the very title, which, by the way, the titles are not inspired, just so you know. If you ever are confused by that, if you ever have a title above, that's not necessarily in, in, uh, inspired. But what my title of my Bible says in Matthew chapter 6 is the cure for anxiety. That's what my Bible title says. And I disagree with whoever wrote that title. Because <laughs> I don't know that it's necessarily the cure. Do this and you will no longer have anxiety. I believe what Jesus offers is a response to anxiety. What a person would not uh, naturally uh, feel. A, a person would naturally feel worried in the moment of, of being in chains and being in prison, about to go before some judge or some king or some religious ruler. What, what person wouldn't feel a sense of worry and dread in that moment? Jesus knows that they would experience some sort of things like that. And his response isn't, how dare you be anxious? That's not, I don't think, what he's saying. But he's saying, hey, it's not going to help you to be anxious. I have a different way for you to respond. 
So if you are anxious about anything, turn to the Lord in these ways. I want to give you three ways that we can respond in the context of anxiety. I could dive into all these texts. I did with the guys actually on Friday uh, a lot more, but I won't do that. But I just want to give you some thoughts here. When I'm anxious and worried and afraid, my response should be that of, and first of all, is prayer. My response should be a prayer with a heart of thanksgiving. That's what Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7 says. Be anxious for nothing, but with everything, with prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request. Three different words for prayer right there. Three different words for prayer. If you're anxious, pray. And if you're still anxious, don't sit there and say, oh, see, it doesn't work. <laughs> right? That's not the point. I, don't, I have no control of your emotions. I can't give you something to make you no longer feel something necessarily. But what I can do is I can point you to the one who can change emotions. I can point you to the one who can calm our, uh, us. And even if he chooses not to do that, then at least you're turning to the Lord in prayer. If anxiety is used to just draw you closer to him, isn't there purpose to your anxiety then? God is redeeming it. Secondly, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, do not worry about tomorrow. He goes through this whole thing about how, look at the birds of the air. They don't, they don't need to worry about the food. God provides for them. He cares. Look at the grass. Look at the flowers of the field. Not even Solomon in all his glory was dressed like this. If God cares for these things, that the grass that is uh, here today and tomorrow thrown into the furnace, he cares for you. And then it says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things that you might worry about, they will be added to you. See, Jesus gives us the response. If you're worried about the, your life and what you will eat and what you will drink and what your situation is and what you're going to go through. If you're worried about those things, Jesus says, seek his kingdom. Let me tell you, when you're seeking Jesus' kingdom, when you're seeking after righteousness... Do your circumstances matter that much if you're seeking his kingdom? Because it's not even about the here and now anyway, right? And the things that are about here and now, it's about sharing the gospel. It's about focusing on those things. And so the fact that you might ha not have what you think that you want or that you need actually doesn't become as big of an issue because you're seeking the thing that matters more. You're seeking after his kingdom. And if you seek after your, his kingdom, after being anxious, and guess what? You're still anxious. What do you do? You keep seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. You continue to do that. Thirdly, Psalm 56, David says, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. Now, if you have a problem with be anxious for nothing or Jesus saying do not worry, if you have any issue with that, at least we can understand where David's coming from. David's saying, when I am afraid, it will happen. I'm going to experience it. But when I'm afraid, you know what I'm going to do? I will trust. I'm going to trust. And if you trust in the Lord and you're still afraid, what do you do? We trust in them again. The reason I say these things, I don't count them as cures. The reason I say all these things is because these things are, are to be our reactions, our responses to anxiety. And if you do these things every time, every time you're anxious, you're praying. Every time you're anxious, you're seeking his kingdom. Every time you fear, you, you turn to the Lord. Oh, what? Sorry, where am I at here? <clears throat> Sorry, there I am. Yep. I put the wrong reference here. I apologize. This is supposed to be... How did I do that? Psalm 56. So this is wrong. I apologize. This is my uh, second point's third application. So, so that's what happens when you're trying to rush with the PowerPoint. So, so I apologize. The, the point I have is trust in the Lord. So ignore that, that last point there. Trust in the Lord. Uh, and the point is, if you're doing all these things every time you're anxious, every time you're afraid, then look at this. You are moving closer to the Lord. God is using and redeeming your anxiety. If every time you're moving closer to the Lord in the midst of your anxiety, then God is redeeming it. I can't promise it away. 
But I can promise that you can move closer to the Lord even through that. That's what I think we as a church need to talk about in regards to the issue of anxiety. It's not always about giving you the cure. It's about, how do I respond? So Jesus says, do not worry. Then he goes on to say, what, don't, what should you not worry about? Don't worry, uh, as we see in verse 11, about how or what you are to speak in your defense. Or what you are to say. Don't worry about those things. You don't need to start preparing your sermon, if that makes any sense in regards to this, right? Those who uh, Jesus is speaking to were going to face these exact things. History tells us that all the disciples, aside from John, who was exiled to the Atmos, uh, uh, island of Patmos, all of them were martyred. They were killed for their faith. They went through multiple kinds of persecution. Even just in the book of Acts, we see multiple forms of persecution. Just a few off the top of my head as we think about this is the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. That was religious leaders. Religious leaders did not like what he had to say. And by the way, if you ever read his defense, really great defense that, that Stephen gives, really powerful in so many different ways. But notice how it's very different than other defenses. Almost every defense is a little bit different. It's, it's not a one-size-fits-all. If you say it this way, then you got it, right? It, Stephen's defense was talking a lot about the, the, the Jewish people and what they went through. And, what they, and he then says, and they rejected the fathers, and guess what? You have rejected Right? And that's kind of Stephen's defense. In Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, we see uh, that uh, James is put to death by the sword. James is put to death by the sword. In Acts chapter 26, we see Paul before King Agrippa. And by the way, after Paul's defense, Agrippa says, Man, you almost have me convinced. Very powerful stories that, that, that really are fulfillments of what Jesus is saying right here. When they do this, they're going to take you into the synagogues. They're going to take you into uh, the places of government, and they're going to persecute. Guzik says this. He says, Jesus spoke these words to men who would face this exact challenge. Thousands upon thousands since have faced this challenge and received God's sustaining grace in it. I believe that Jesus is saying this to his disciples, and it's what they went through, amen? But I also think it's for us too. Yes. Yes. I think it's for us too. I think it's a, we should consider it a privilege that we have been so free to worship the Lord in this country without much persecution whatsoever. <clears throat> but please know that persecution is alive today. It is alive today throughout the entire world. There are Christians out there in many different countries dying for their faith. In many countries, they do not have the same privileges that we do. And I want to rejoice in the fact that we can worship the Lord freely. I want to rejoice in that. But I have a fear. I have a fear that we are nearing a coming day when we will experience more severe persecution. I am concerned even more that the church in America, generally speaking, not specifying any of you or our church specifically or any specific church, not trying to do that, but generally speaking, I fear that there's a day where the church in America generally will not be able to stand to the persecution because they have been caught lazy and compromising in that privilege. That is a fear that I have. And I hope that that would not be the case for us here today. I don't know that a day is coming. I say I, I'm concerned about it. I see that it could come. But I do know this. The words of Jesus don't give us an excuse to be neglectful. The words of Jesus don't give us permission to be caught off guard. In fact, Clark says it this way. He says, this is without encouraging sloth and negligence and without dispersing with the obligation we are under to prepare ourselves by the meditation of sacred truths, by the study of the Holy Scriptures and by prayer. Just because Jesus says, hey, don't worry about what you're to say in that time, in that moment, doesn't mean that we say, oh, well, I don't, I don't need to really think about the Bible too much. I don't really need to have a defense at all because, well, the 
the, the Holy Spirit is going to give it to me in the moment. So I don't need to worry about any of that. I think the understanding is that we are so in tune with God and the Holy Spirit that in the day that that comes, we don't need to worry as we're facing any sort of persecution because all we need to do is be close to Jesus, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And in that time, the Holy Spirit will speak through us. I believe Jesus makes these statements with the understanding that we are abiding in Christ, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And, oh, Christian, be sure that you are listening to the voice of God through the Word and not shutting out the conviction and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus is speaking to the disciples, disciples that would follow after Jesus. How unfortunate it would be for someone to say, yeah, I'm a Christian, uh, but I'm going to live my life in, the, in whatever, this sin. You fill in the blank of whatever that sin is. I'm going to continue living. I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to keep doing things the way I want to do them. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. When that person faces any kind of persecution or, or per persecution or judgment, you better be sure that they actually have a problem with their defense because they haven't worked through their defense at that time. You see, we should work through our defense. Not at this time, not at this moment, right as we face judgment. It should have already been done. We should have already wrestled with our defense. So Christian, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you will not need to worry about what you need to say. But be sure that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, do not worry about what you are to say or your defense. But we are called to have a defense. We are called to that. We are called to have a defense for our faith. Jesus is not declaring that you do not need to consider a defense at all, but that you have walked with him, and in having walked with him, you will, you, he will give you the right words at the right time. If you do not uh, consider your defense before the time of persecution, then there is going to be a problem. Where do I get this idea that we need to think of our defense? We're going to turn there in a little bit to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Paul, uh, or, I'm sorry, Peter is telling uh, his readers to be ready to give an answer. Be prepared. Be ready. So it's not that we don't have to think about our defense whatsoever. But the point is that when we're faced with intense, deep persecution, we don't need to worry as long as we've been abiding in Jesus. If we're not abiding in Jesus, that's a whole other issue, isn't it? I can almost guarantee if you're not abiding in Christ at the time that you need to give a defense, it may not sound very good. That's why we need to be abiding in Jesus and he will give us what we need. If you have not considered your defense before the time of persecution, there will be a problem. Now, this word defense is the same word that we get our word apologetics from. Uh, if you actually study it in the Greek, it, it's very similar. Apologetics. Guzik says this, it means to make a defense or give an adequate answer. We get the modern term apologetics from just this word and idea. And if you are faced with persecution, and you do not, uh, if you are ever faced with, with persecution, do not use that time to just try to figure out, well, what are you going to say? Worrying about what you're going to say. That should already be considered. Use that time to draw near to the Lord. Use that time to abide in Him. Use that time to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's more about our connection with Jesus than it is about how eloquent you can say something or how smart your defense is. It's not really about that, is it? It's about abiding in Jesus. Turn with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter. There's a few texts. Peter's talking about persecution in a few different ways and for application. I wanted us to look at what I'm saying from Peter's perspective. I have a couple points of application. The first one is be ready for and rejoice in persecution. That's what, that's what uh, Peter tells us. Look at chapter 4, verse 12 through 14. Paul, Peter says this, Behold, uh, I'm sorry, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you 
which comes upon you for testing. For your testing. As though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ. Keep on rejoicing. So that also at the revelation of his glory. You may rejoice with exaltation. We're called to rejoice. If we are counted as worthy to suffer the sufferings of Christ. We should rejoice in that. But be ready. Don't be surprised. What's going on? Why are people talking to me this way? No, that's not our reaction. Our reaction should say, hey, I'm a follower of Christ. That's going to get me into some hot water sometimes. And that's okay. Be ready for when that time comes. Secondly, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, be ready to make a defense at all times. You know why you don't need to worry about your defense right before you're going to experience that persecution? It's because you've already wrestled it out. Look at what 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 says. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. See, we're called to have an offense. This word is the exact same word that's in our text. I'm sorry, it's not the exact same word. It's it's uh, it's the same root uh, of the word. Uh, so it's the same. It's pretty much the same word, but it, it's slightly changed. But you get the point. It's from it's from the same word. And, and, and this word for defense is the same word that we're talking about in our text. So we need to have a defense. We need to be ready at all times, in all seasons, in all situations. Be ready with your defense. Ruth and I were just talking today. How, what, what was the quote? A pastor should uh, be able to preach, pray, or die pre at any time. Preach, pray, or die. Right? We need to have that kind of approach in our own lives, in our own hearts. We need to be ready. Mm -hmm. We need to be ready to have defense. And thirdly, look at First Peter chapter four, verse nineteen. Therefore, those who al those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls. To a faithful creator in doing what is right. I'm going to make this point. I think it's important. Dad and I talk a lot about intimacy with God. We talk a lot about walking with God. We talk a lot about connection with God. These are all crucial. And in the moments of persecution, you know what you need more than a great defense? You need to be connected to the vine. You need to be connected to Jesus. And trust your soul to the one who is faithful. That leads me to my third and final point. What you ought to say. <laughs> Jesus goes on to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. This is a wonderful promise, is it not? The Holy Spirit will teach you the Holy Spirit will teach you. Strong says this, the word to teach means to teach literally, to cause to learn. That's what it literally means, cause to learn, to instruct or impart knowledge. And it's amazing that in this time of distress and persecution, God promises for those that are abiding in him that he will teach you what you are to say. Guzik says this, this isn't a justification of poor preparation in teaching and preaching God's word, but it is a promise of strength and guidance for the persecuted and to have an opportunity to testify of Jesus. This is about opportunity that you never know how God will use. I was thinking a lot as I was preparing the sermon uh, yesterday, specifically, uh, about Stephen. And... I, I, I have no knowledge of what he was thinking or feeling as he was saying all these things. But I almost wonder if, if there could have been an element where it's like, I said all the things I said, I said what I need to say, but there's no fruit from this, right? I, I, I'm still going to die and he ends up dying, right? Mm -hmm. But God uses Stephen's death in incredible ways. One of the biggest things that comes out of Stephen's death is that the word of God spreads throughout the world. The disciples scatter because of the persecution. And by scattering, the word of the Lord goes to the Gentiles. It goes to all the world. And even though Stephen's death must have been very tragic for the people there, obviously it's an awful situation, God uses Stephen's death for his honor and for his glories. 
I even believe, if you don't mind me saying, this is my own thinking, I'm not saying that this is the word of God per se, but I would argue, I believe that Stephen's death probably had a profound impact on Paul. Because Paul was there. Paul heard what Stephen had to say. He was not converted. He did not uh, entrust himself to Jesus at this point in time, but he heard what Stephen had to say. And when Paul became saved, I imagine how many times he must have thought of Stephen. I could be wrong, but I imagine that there was a very deep connection there. And Stephen had no knowledge of what that would do, what his words would mean, what, his, what kind of impact that would all have. And I'll tell you this, you don't know what kind of impact your words will have upon someone you're sharing the gospel with. You don't know. It may not come in the way you expect. Sometimes we walk away from situations, ah, oh, I should have said it this way, I, I should have said it that way, I, 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 I could have done that, I could have said that. And I would just say, listen, take the moment, whenever you're sharing the gospel with anyone, whether it's in regards to persecution or not, just rest and trust in the Lord to give you the words to say for that moment. You don't know what that person needs. You don't know what that person needs to hear. All you know is, Lord, lead me. Teach me, even in this moment, what you want me to say. Be ready, right? But let us also entrust ourselves to God in those moments. Clark says this, neither surprise or defic uh, 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 deficit of talents, nor even ignorance itself could hurt the cause of God when the hearts and minds of those men were influenced by the Holy Spirit. If your heart is influenced by the Holy Spirit, God will use you as his tool. It is not up to you to have the right argument or the wondrous words. Don't trust your own abilities or your own speech. Trust in him. You want his words, not your own. Be intimate with Jesus and follow him and allow him to use you in the ways that he wants. So in every circumstance, yes, be ready to give a defense and cling to Jesus. Don't worry. You will be a ready instrument for God to use in his timing to accomplish his work. Just be ready and walk with him. So with that in mind, three points of application. The first is this. Do not trust yourself and your own, ability, your own abilities. I really think that's Jesus' main point here. To say, listen, don't worry about what you're to say. Rely on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will teach you. Trust in Him. Don't trust your ability to figure it out. Second, listen to the teaching, to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And finally and thirdly, I've said it many times, but it's the truth and it's what we need more than anything else in our lives. Walk in intimacy with God. Walk in intimacy with God. Would you bow in meditation? Father, we come to you today. I pray that you would help us to trust you, to walk closely with you, to rely on you. But we're so it's so easy for us to get in our own ways. It's so easy for anxiety to get our minds off of you. Lord, it's so easy for our circumstances to get us distracted, but Lord, we pray that you would help us. Help us to have our hearts and our minds and our attention fixed on you. Lord, we would ask that in those moments that we may experience any sort of persecution, Lord, that you would help us to stand with our defense, trusting in the Holy Spirit to teach us what we are to say in those moments. Father, may we be a people who rely on you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs>
place of anxiety, remember, keep praying. Yeah. Keep seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. Keep trusting in him. Have a great day.